Hello there, I am Michael, an assistant librarian at the Scott County Public Library in beautiful Georgetown, Kentucky. And thank you for joining me for another unsolved mystery case. Today we will be revisiting the case of D.B. Cooper, the only successful American hijacker of a commercial aircraft. He got away with a $200,000 ransom, or did he? Nothing seemed unusual about the businessman who walked onto Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 on November 24, 1971. He was dressed well in his sunglasses, white shirt, and dark business suit. He carried an attache case and blended in well with his fellow travelers. He had paid $18.52 for the short one-way flight from Portland to Seattle on that cold sunny afternoon. He was about six feet tall in his mid-forties and gave his name as Dan Cooper, which of course, as you know, turned out later to be a fake name. The steward said he ordered a bourbon and coke, had a cigarette, and then handed the stewardess a note. The note said he had a bomb in his attache case and in fact showed it to the flight attendant. Inside the case were wires attached to red sticks, supposedly dynamite. The captain was then made aware of his demands. He required $200,000 in $20 bills as well as four parachutes. Getting the ransom and the parachutes together would take some time so the captain circled the flight and then later made it to Seattle. There, the 36 passengers and two crew members disembarked in exchange for the ransom. The flight attendant said the man was very polite cordial and calm. The other passengers didn't even know what was going on. The plane, staffed with four remaining crew members, that'd be two pilots, a flight engineer, and the stewardess, then took off to Mexico City. Cooper demanded the jet fly lower than 10,000 feet at a speed of under 200 knots. He ordered everyone into the cockpit and closed the door. Some time later, Cooper lowered the stairs at the back of the plane and clutching his cash, jumped, probably shortly after 10 p.m., never to be heard from again. After they discovered he was gone, the plan then landed safely in Reno, Nevada. As news of the hijacking spread, one reporter accidentally called him D.B. Cooper, and that misnomer stuck, and he's been referred to as D.B. Cooper ever since. FBI agents collected whatever evidence was available his clip-on necktie, and eight cigarette butts. They couldn't examine the ransom note because the hijacker had evidently taken it with him. The FBI had a very typical description, a white male, six foot, one inch tall, 175 pounds, mid-40s, olive complexion, brown eyes, black hair, conventional cut, parted on the left. Now at that time, there were no security measures like we have today. In 1971, you just bought a ticket and boarded the plane. This incident would incite the airlines to begin security measures so they would know who was on their planes. The FBI investigated over 800 suspects, but no one could be singled out and prosecuted as the hijacker. But some people theorized that he never even survived the jump. After all, he was diving into 200 mile per hour winds and might not have been able to deploy his chute. Even if he did get the chute open, it was a night, not the type of parachute that could be easily guided or steered, and landing in rough wooden terrain at night was dangerous, particularly the way the man was dressed in a suit, loafers, and trench coat. Law enforcement was actually following the plane in another craft, but unfortunately they did not see Cooper jump. So, what happened? To the hijacker? To the money? In 1980, a boy camping with his family on the banks of the Columbia River found $5,800 buried in the mud. Serial numbers indicated that this was part of the ransom Cooper had disappeared with. The location of the find was near Portland, Oregon, several miles from Cooper's suspected jump zone near Area, Washington. The area was thoroughly searched by law enforcement, but no other evidence was found. They didn't find his body, or a parachute, or a satchel containing the other bundles of money. 
Some think the money was carried down river and he may have actually landed up river somewhere. But again, law enforcement is perplexed. Just last year, in 2020, an amateur scientist shared that he had discovered microscopic bits of algae called diatoms on the money that had been dug up in 1980. These diatoms on these bills only bloom in spring, and the bills had only one season of this algae on them, indicating the money did not go into the water in 1971 when Cooper jumped. Did someone place the money here later, to be found much later by someone else just to throw the officials off? I think so. As I said, there were many suspects in the hijacking over the years. Some might even surprise you. <laughs> they surprised me. Let's take a look at some of the most popular suspects in the crime, and then you decide. One of the early suspects was a man named Ted Mayfield. On the day of the hijacking, six people called into the FBI to put the finger on Ted Mayfield. He was a skydiving teacher with a criminal record including armed robbery and stealing an airplane. Although no one could say exactly why they think it was him, they were all sure that he was the man. The FBI crossed him off their list pretty quickly though. The odd thing was, the FBI even got a call from Mayfield himself. For four hours after Cooper jumped out of the plane, Mayfield called the FBI with a list of local skydivers he thought could be responsible. Some thought he was just trying to mislead the FBI and point them away from himself, and that could be true. The FBI had given Cooper four, four parachutes, one of which was sewn shut and would not work. This was in line with Mayfield because he had actually given two of his students parachutes that had not worked and sent them plummeting to their deaths. Apparently Mayfield, like D.B. Cooper, couldn't spot a faulty chute after all. This fellow is Richard Floyd McCoy, Jr. During the following year, after D.B. Cooper's hijacking, 15 copycats tried to hijack airplanes by following Cooper's methods. Some think that one of the copycats, McCoy Jr., might have been D.B. Cooper himself. McCoy demanded a $500,000 ransom as he hijacked a plane using an unloaded gun and a paperweight that looked like a grenade. He escaped by parachuting off the aft stairs, just like Cooper, but McCoy left enough fingerprints to get himself caught. He ended up breaking out of prison with a fake handgun made of toothpaste yes, toothpaste, and spent three months on the run before FBI agents tracked him to Virginia and killed him in a shootout. McCoy's family was impossible for McCoy to have done the Cooper hijacking because he was in Nevada celebrating Thanksgiving with his family. But others think his family was just providing a convenient alibi, and he really was Cooper. Dwayne Weber. As I told you earlier, in 1980, an eight-year-old boy named Brian Ingram was wandering along a riverbank near Seattle when he found a stash of badly burned money. He showed it to his parents, who reported it, and they found out they were holding part of D.B. Cooper's ransom. It was one of the biggest points against Dwayne Weber, a man who was at the very same spot just four months before Ingram found the money. Weber had told his wife that he wanted to go for a walk alone down by the river, which gave him a chance to drop off the money. She didn't think much of it until three days before he died when he told her, I am Dan Cooper. His wife went to the library and took out a book on Cooper, only to find out that her husband's handwritten notes were all over the margins. She started to put things together, like her husband's nightmares during which he would mutter something about leaving fingerprints on the aft stairs. But the DNA tests were inconclusive. Barbara Dalton. Hmm. According to some experts at the time, D.B. Cooper wasn't a man, and her name was Barbara Dalton. She was a trans woman born and raised with the name Robert until a sex change operation in 1969. 
Due to her poor eyesight, she was turned down by the Air Force and commercial airlines again and again. Being broke and depressed, she started plotting to hijack a plane. She switched back to her male appearance, keeping her wig in a bag, her blouse under her suit, and hijacked the plane. And after jumping out, all she had to do was take off the suit, slip on the wig, and she was nearly unidentifiable. A hospital worker said that Barbara came in two weeks after the hijacking and seemed strangely unworried about money, even though she had been depressed and unemployed for the last few months. She also confessed to being Cooper in 1977. Kenneth Christensen. Kenneth Christensen was another suspect, and he was fingered by his own brother, who was watching a documentary about the hijacking when he thought the story was, hmm, actually about my own brother. Kenneth had been a paratrooper in World War II. After it ended, he worked as a flight attendant on Northwest Orient Airlines. Kenneth never had much money, well, until 1972 when he suddenly had enough money to buy a new house with cash. When he was dying of cancer, he called his brother over to his bedside and said, there is something you should know, but I cannot tell you. But after his death, his brother discovered Kenneth had over $200,000 in his bank account and a collection of gold coins. He also had a folder full of Northwest Orient news clippings from dates up until the date of the hijacking, and then they stopped. For some reason, he didn't have any clippings of the Cooper hijacking, even though it was the biggest Northwest, North, Northwest Orient news story yet. When Florence Schaffner, the flight attendant who spoke and served drinks to Cooper the most during the infamous flight, saw a picture of Kenneth Christensen, she said he was the best fit yet, and quote, you might be onto something here. So she thought it definitely could be Kenneth Christensen. This handsome fellow is William Gossett. Gossett was an Army Air Force veteran in both Korea and Vietnam, specially trained in parachuting and wilderness survival. An attorney named Galen Cook told newspapers that Gossett was Cooper. Gossett had been obsessed with the hijacking story his whole life, and according to Cook, Gossett had even confessed to a friend that he was the hijacker. Cook got most of his story out of tabloids, but the Gossett's son thinks it's true. William Gossett, according to his son, was a compulsive gambler who never had a penny except in December of 1971 when he showed up with, quote, wads of cash. If Gossett is Cooper, the money didn't last long. Shortly after the hijacking, his son says, Gossett went to Las Vegas and blew every penny he had. This is Robert Rackstraw. My, he's my pick for actually being the hijacker himself. Robert Rackstraw was a military man with parachute training, too, right up until the date of the hijacking. In 1971, Rackstraw was kicked out of the military for lying about his education. He spent 1971 living with his stepfather and floating $75,000 in fake checks to get by. Shortly after D.B. Cooper jumped out of the plane, a warrant went out for Rackstraw's arrest for using the fake checks. The police knocked on his door looking for him, but all they found was his stepfather lying dead with a bullet to his head. By then, Robert had fled to Iran and stayed there until forced to leave in 1978. He was arrested upon entering the United States, but believe it or not, a jury found him innocent of the murder charges. He continued to run covert CIA missions in Iran, kind of the CIA's bad boy, but the boy who could get things done, if you know what I mean. This is a later picture of Robert Rackstraw. An FBI investigative team found more than 100 materials which incriminated Rackstraw, including DNA, direct evidence, testimonial, and documentary evidence. They concluded that Rackstraw was indeed Cooper. But did he get prosecuted for the crime? Nope. The FBI declined to prosecute even though they had a strong case. 
Some think they chose not to prosecute to protect and shield his CIA missions overseas. Yep, if I was a betting man, my money would go on Robert Rackstraw as the suspect. It seems the CIA was trying to protect some of their missions, and that is why he was never arrested and convicted. But will we ever know for sure? I doubt it. With the innovations in crime technology, I feel the FBI could solve it now with DNA evidence, fingerprints, etc. But I don't think that will ever be done conclusively again to protect the various covert missions assigned to Rackstraw. So those are your main suspects. Please join me again for another Unsolved Mystery and be sure to follow Scott County Public Library on Facebook and YouTube. So this is Michael signing off with Unsolved Mysteries. Until next time, have a great day.